is being reported. This morning, we want to share with you Niagara Region's targeted Seawalk ex expansion plan with you. We will be providing you with a lot of information this morning, and it is understandable that you will have many questions. Please know that my team and I will be available in supporting you throughout this process. Today's meeting is not the only opportunity for you to ask questions or to digest the information. At the end of the day, uh, our goal is that collectively we want to realize our expansion targets so we can support more children and families with spaces so we so desperately need in the region. The format of our meeting today will be that Kayla Jordan, uh, our manager of system planning and evaluation, will lead us through a presentation that will explain our process and our plan. At the end, we will take any questions you may have. To be respectful to all participants, I will ask you to keep yourself on mute for the presentation and raise your hand or type your question at the end of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah. And before I do that, Sarah, if you don't mind uh, just admitting people as they're coming in, there's a few more that are coming in. Yep, not a problem. I'll keep an eye on it. Thanks, Atinder. Um, My name is Kayla Jordan. I'm the manager of systems planning and evaluation here at Niagara Region. I'm really pumped to be here. Like Satinder was mentioning, we're all pretty excited about the idea of in increasing access and expanding our sector. So thank you for having me here. And uh, before I get any further, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the treaty lands that we're on today, um, especially because this June is National Indigenous History Month and tomorrow will be National Indigenous Peoples Day. So I encourage you to join us in reflecting on our journey through truth and reconciliation. So Niagara Region is situated on treaty land, and this lit land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hadiwendrong, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The regional municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in of the lands on which we live. So like Satinder uh, mentioned already, we're here uh, to gather um, both existing and potential licensed childcare operators the information and resources that you need to apply for expansion under our targeted expansion plan. So I'll start out with a little bit on the background of growth and, and expansion, Niagara, a bit about our priority neighborhoods, and then we're going to walk through the application. So who needs to apply, what's in the application package, evaluating packages, and when you need to get those applications in by, uh, as well as going over startup grants and fee subsidy uh, toward the end of the presentation. So a little bit of background, uh, Niagara Region is expected to grow in our, uh, our 0 to 12 or 0 to 14 year old age groups uh, with an increase of by 31% uh, by in the next 20 years or so. So we're expecting children living in Niagara, that population to grow significantly. At the same time, we've seen now a reduction in the uh, fees that families pay for childcare services across part of the Canada-wide early learning and childcare plan. So if you can put the pieces of the puzzle together, we have a steadily increasing child population. We have decreasing cost of childcare. It goes without saying that we have, we're gonna expect increasing childcare demand in an already um, high demand for childcare um, region. So to address this increase in childcare demand, both in Niagara and across the province, the Ministry of Education has released Ontario's Access and Inclusion Framework. 
The components of that framework that address access include access equity, making sure that those who need spaces in vulnerable populations are accessing those spaces, as well as inclusion. What are we doing for diversity, equity, inclusion? What are we doing for uh, rec truth and reconciliation? We also uh, address in that access and inclusion framework accessibility and participation and belonging. So what does our pedagogy look like in ensuring that those who participate in early learning and child care in Ontario have that sense of belonging, are able to participate, and that we see equity across various different population groups? So one part is that access and inclusion framework to make sure that we're including in our growth the right uh, populations and that we're ensuring that it's done in a, a sound way. The other part is seeing that growth. So as part of our collaboration with the Ministry of Education, we've been we've come up with some targets for how many spaces we need to see grow on an annual basis um, up until the end of the implementation of the Canada Wide Early Learning and Child Care Plan in 2026. So we have we expect or we will be set we've set the goal for 4067 spaces between now and 2026. Um, our 2022 targets have already been accounted for, and we also see that our spaces are broken down by school based spaces and community spaces, those spaces that aren't in schools. Our school based spaces have been allocated based on the capital building um, process with the school boards and the ministry. So we're mostly talking today about our community based spaces. So 3,685. The Ministry of Education has let us know that we'll review our targets on an annual basis. And so there is some flexibility in, in what these numbers look like. Now, when we established these targets, we also established where we needed to see growth happening. So we identified what we call priority neighborhoods and Niagara Region used some geospatial analytics uh, that layered various sources of data uh, to help us reach a certain targeted ratio and that's 37% or one in every three children to be able to have access to childcare for our zero to five population. So we started out with a series of data, our primary data, which included census boundaries, where our existing child care centers are, uh, where children are waiting for child care. So we looked at our one list data, uh, as well as Niagara's official plan for population growth areas. And again, we layered that on with that access ratio of, of 37 percent or what we would call a child care desert. Then we incorporated some of those variables from the access and inclusion framework to really ensure that we're targeting population areas of vulnerable families. So we looked at low income families, uh, communities vulnerable because of uh, no high school education, lone parents, or our early development instrument data to target um, developmental vulnerability. We also looked at diverse communities, so newcomers, language spoken at home, as well as where our Francophone and Indigenous families are located. Now, through all the magic of geospatial analysis, we've identified 12 target um, priority neighborhoods across Niagara region. At the end of this deck, we have the maps of those regions and we'll also be distributing the maps of the targeted uh, priority neighborhoods at the end of the presentation um, this afternoon. Now, because data changes and because where we see growth is going to change, these neighborhoods may shift as we continue to assess our demand and, and analyze data. We also want to acknowledge that the boundaries, while they're based on data and, and analysis, um, are a little bit flexible. So we're looking at bordering priority neighborhoods as well, so the neighbors to these neighborhoods. Now we're ready to talk a little bit more about the targeted expansion application. 
And the first part I want to walk you through is who needs to apply for targeted expansion. So it's a little bit complicated because we have a process for with the Ministry of Education for getting service system manager approvals. We have a little bit from the ministry and then a little bit for our own application system that uh, helps us assess where that whether expansion projects are meeting our needs through our targeted growth um, plan. So just to start out, if you're not currently enrolled in Seawelk in Niagara region and you don't wish to enroll in Seawelk in Niagara region, what you have to do is a, head straight to the Ministry of Education. So if it's a revision to an existing license, you go directly through CCLS process with the Ministry of Education. If you're opening a new center, you do need service system manager, that's us, um, approval. So you need to submit the Ministry of Education's new license application form, and that can be found on CCLS. Now, we might have folks who aren't currently enrolled in Seawelk with Niagara Region, but want to enroll in Seawelk with Niagara Region. And this might be because you are an existing operator who didn't uh, sign on with Seawelk last year, or you might be new to the region. So if you're an existing operator and you don't really want to make any changes to your license, but you do want to jump on board with Seawelk, you'll need to go through our application package process as well as our budget template and I'll tell you more about those forms in a minute. If you want to join Seawelk and make a revision to an existing license, you'll need to do the same thing, you, uh, the application package and the budget template. You don't need to do the ministry's form in these two cases. Now if you're opening a completely new center, you're going to need to do our application package and go through that process as well as the budget template. And you're also going to need to complete the Ministry of Education's new license application confirmation form. So we expect this not to be the majority on this slide, but where most folks will fall into the process is on this slide. So this is anybody who's already enrolled and signed a contract with Niagara Region for Seawell. If you need to revise an existing license, but you don't really have any changes, increase or decrease to your license capacity, um, or a decrease or no change, then all you need to do is that Ministry of Education form, which you can set, submit to our child care systems at Niagara Region ca email address we'll sign that and send it back to you you don't need to go through the process if that's your situation if and, and some of these cases might be if you're changing the location of one of your rooms or um you know there's there's a, a change to your alternate capacity but you're not really seeing an increase or a decrease you're changing age groups that kind of thing if you want to revise your license and increase your license capacity, you're still going to have to do that ministry form, the in, um, license revision form, but we'd also need you to go through the application process. So the application package and our budget template. If you're opening a brand new center, you're already enrolled with us, then your application package, as well as the Ministry of Education's new license application form. That's a lot, um, but re remember that we'll send out these materials so you can drill down and take a look. And of course, we're well, uh, open for questions. Now, there's a bit of a caveat. Because of the way that the guidelines from the ministry rolled out, there were some folks who kind of got caught in the pipeline. And if you're one of those, so if your floor plans were approved by the ministry prior to January 1st and you're enrolled in Seawelk, you're automatically going to be approved for further Seawelk funding for those spaces for which the floor plan was approved. So you can just submit that form directly to us. Now, what does this application package that I've been talking about look like? We have a application package, which is a PDF fillable form. We have a budget template. 
we have those two Ministry of Education forms. So there's one for new licenses, one for license revision. So make sure that you're, um, you're grabbing the right form for that. Uh, and then the, an application checklist, just to make sure you have all the right components of your application. So this is what the first page of that application package looks like. Like I mentioned, it's a fillable PDF form, and you can email that to us at childcaresystems at niagararegion.ca. And this form will walk you through a number of different questions to help us get a better idea of who's applying, um, what the details are of the expansion or new spaces itself, uh, a little bit about your organization, and then information about your site, uh, so the actual license spaces that we're expecting to see. We also ask about your base fees, if you already have base fees in Niagara Region or elsewhere if you're a new centre, but that's just for existing operators. Uh, we also ask about staffing and compensation. So what's your plan? As we know, uh, it's hard to come by RECEs these days. So we'd like to know what your plan is to recruit and retain RECEs to accommodate your expansion. We also assess financial viability through a series of questions, as well as our budget template, which I'll talk to you about next. We ask a few questions about access and inclusion, as well as your need for startup grants, and then in an attestation to make sure that all that data is correct. This is what the budget template looks like. We ask all operators who are applying uh, through the, the process to fill this out, where we ask the number of full-time equivalents as well as the projected amount for 2023 uh, or whichever year you are applying um, based on a number of different categories to help us understand uh, your financial viability. Here's those Ministry of Education uh, new license application forms, and this one would be the revision form. And these can be found on CCLS or uh, let us know if you can't find them. We have a copy for you too. And uh, again, there's one for a revision if you're not changing your license uh, number and a new application if you have a new license number. So if you're changing premise, you have to go through the new license application form. And then last, an application checklist to make sure you have all the right pieces in there. Now, what happens uh, with these applications that you've put time into and, and energy and thought? You'll submit your application to childcare systems at niagararegion.ca. And then children's services staff are going to take a look at those applications and score them based on a scoring matrix using objective criteria. And we will, based on that evaluation, we'll notify you about the decision to move forward by email. After that, those who are participating in expansion will go through a process for new contracts or adjustments to contracts with Niagara. And we'll also go through a process for startup funding, um, similar to a capital grant uh, funding uh, process with Niagara Region. And then lastly, service providers are going to have to let us know uh, once they can confirm the date of opening uh, their newer expanded spaces. And we will uh, flow funding based on um, a number of different data elements to service providers after that. So what are these packages evaluated on? Uh, the first priority data element is whether you're an existing operator with Niagara Region, if you're already contracted with us. Priority will also be given to projects that fall within our priority neighborhoods, those that are mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. We need to maintain an auspice ratio of 80% in Niagara region, so we will be looking at auspice. We also have some other uh, variables that help us address that access and inclusion framework and make sure that we're supporting uh, families who need it the most. So we'll be looking at whether your center offers flexible scheduling during non-traditional hours or part-time care, three days a week, that kind of thing. Francophone or indigenous programs, 
what your uh, organization's approach is to equity, diversity, and inclusion, what kind of policy or pedagogy you apply to reduce developmental vulnerability, what your policies and supports are for children with special needs, your intended staff salaries, your staff recruitment and retention plan, and then last, your financial viability. So when do these need to be in? Uh, by for, If you are expecting to build in 2023, the application needs to be submitted by Friday, July 14th for a full evaluation. If you submit after July 14th for 2023 build, it's going to be on a first come first serve basis, and it's going to depend on funding av uh, availability. So the best uh, chance of moving forward would be to get your application in by July 14th. If you're intending to build in 2024 or 25 or 2026, please submit by August 4th. That's when we'll be evaluating the bulk of evaluate of applications uh, for our later year builds or expansions. And again, anything submitted after August 4th will be considered, but we're going to have to do that based on what's already been approved, what how much funding is remains. So I'm going to pause there for a moment to take some questions prior to talking a little bit more about capital grants or sorry, startup funding is what we call it. We have a question from Kim Cole, but before I go there, I just want to talk a little bit about the deadline. So I know these are a fairly tight turnaround for 2023, and I, and I just want to emphasize what Kayla has said is um, if you get it in after July 14th, it will still be considered. As you saw in the earlier slide, we have 590 spaces that we need to build. We're trying to see how we can manage um, uh, the growth for this year. So if you do end up getting it after July 14th, it will be considered, but it will be first come first serve basis. Um, so we have a question from Kim. Kim, go ahead. Okay, good morning. Um, my question is in regards to the spaces. If we're lucky enough to get registered early childhood educators, would we not want to consider going up to our license capacity first before we're operating or before we're opening new spaces. So that is a decision you as an organization will need to make, right? So if you do have, assuming you have staff, assuming you're able to get additional staff, what are your aspirational goals as an organization? Are you looking for expansion? Um, so that is a decision that each individual organization will need to assess and make based on their own vision and strategic plan. But that wouldn't help with the number of spaces then, correct? If you're going up to your license capacity, those spaces, those spaces are already accounted for. So if you are licensed for 100 spaces right now and you're operating at 50 and you fill up to 100, um, we will be paying you based on operating capacity. So the number of ch children you serve, at least for 2023, um, will be we will be paying the revenue replacement related to those children. Okay. 2024, the fund funding formula is changing uh, as the ministry has communicated, so we don't know what the funding would look like for 2024. Okay, and just one more question. Um, so I noticed that the school board numbers are lower than the community. Um, right now we're finding the school board is more financially feasible. Um, the rents for commercial is skyrocketing, and we're finding that every time we have a contract renewal, uh, yeah, we don't know what we're going to do. So just wondering about that conversation. Yeah, good question. Um, so I think it's important to note that those capital spaces for school builds are spaces that have been planned as part of the capital expansion. So it does not preclude you from having a conversation with the school board to say, hey, is this space in your school being used? And if it's not, the school can mark that space as non-instructional and those spaces could be accounted for a community. So I think that's the distinction is that if it's already planned as part of the capital build, 
for the schools. Those spaces have already been accounted for. Those plans are submitted a few years ahead. Um, that's where those spaces come from. It does not by any means preclude you from opening up another center or spaces in school. The school, if it is a child care center zero to four, they will have to um, declare that space as non-instructional. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kim. Good questions. Uh, we have one for Mackenzie at Hickory Creek. What if you're expecting to open in 2023, but things get delayed and you open in January? Uh, good question. So we do know that construction um, can be delayed. Uh, so the way we're structured right now is uh, we will be, our targets will be reviewed on an annual basis. So there is some flexibility to move into um 2024, but those conversations should be happening with us early and often. So we need to know what your official plan is. Following that, if there are unexpected delays, uh, we will require regular communication updates from you so we can keep the ministry updated as well. At the end of the day, we don't want to lose our spaces. So if that means we need to work with the ministry to say we were planning on opening in 2023, but for these reasons, we need to just shift these spaces into 2024. We just need to have that conversation with the ministry. So there is some flexibility around there. Uh, another question we have from Jody, uh, what if we want to expand and have for years but can't find suitable space? How do we complete the application forms to show our desire? So the way the expansion is working is it is based on where you're looking to uh, open. So you have a window between now and 2026 is when our spaces are available. So uh, I would encourage you to sort of seek out where you can find space and then target backwards to which year can you actually open if that makes any sense. I, I hear you on the challenge of finding suitable space, and we are going to be working with our economic development, our planning, as well as the local lands to figure out if there are spaces we can identify that would be suitable for each child care community. I don't want to promise or commit to you on that right now. All we're doing is we're having a conversation to see if that is additional information we could provide to the sector to support you with your expansion. Uh, E E L C C uh, as a question, the funding we're applying for, is that for operating funding only or is there startup funding available for the new build, for example? There is startup funding available and Kayla's going to walk us through that in the next few slides. Any questions around the application process, around uh, the submission of, of those applications or anything related to uh, what the plan looks like for expansion? Well, I think we're good to move forward. We can also come back at the end of the presentation if you do think of anything else. Absolutely. Thanks, Satinder. So now we'll go into uh, those recipients of targeted expansion. So we have uh, startup grants, and these startup grants are designed to support the creation of new licensed full day spaces for children under six in those priority neighborhoods, uh, which target underserviced uh, communities and families. And startup grants can be used for retrofits, renovations, and expansion projects. The, the amount of the startup grant funding uh, for center-based care, $90 per square foot of a new or an expanded space to a cap of $350,000 for every 50 child care spa uh, spaces. For home child care, there is a maximum of $1,000 per Seawelk space created uh, with a cap of up to $6,000 per home provider. Funding is released based on a milestone schedule. So uh, operators will be asked to submit as part of their application, the milestones of their project and to keep children's services updated on their progress through those milestones by notifying our child care systems email. Uh, so the general structure is to uh, flow 20% at the execution of our service agreement. So when we first sign on, then 50% once we've confirmed the construction permits, 20% based on structural framing uh, for renovations or addi additions, and then the final 10% once you've confirmed it opens for business. Now, I understand that some uh, projects won't follow the same uh, type of 
uh, timelines or hit the same types of milestones. So alternate pay payment plans will be considered when you request them, but it'll be uh, it won't all be flowed up front. It'll be flowed based on milestone achievement. There are some commitments if you are a recipient of a capital gr uh, a startup grant. Uh, the first is that the operator has to commit to participate in Seawelk until 2026. You also need to spend your funding within two years of the signed service agreement. So projects can't take more than two years. You must uh, finish your project by December 31st of the year that you intended to finish. So we understand that projects go later, uh, but you need to finish within the year that you in, uh, anticipated finishing. So if you plan to finish in January of 2024, then you have until December 31st to actually finish. But if you intend to finish in December, uh, then you still need to you need to finish within that year. So you need to finish in December. It's the funding is also for you to prioritize the creation of and access to new full day spaces for children zero to four and in those communities with vulnerable children and children from diverse populations. Eligible expenditures are different for center based and licensed home childcare. For center based, you can use startup grants for play materials, equipment, furnishings, uh, non consumable supplies, equipment for ongoing operation, renovation, renovations, additions, and repairs as approved by Children's Services. Changes to an outdoor play space if it's to comply with the CCEYA requirements and leasehold improvements. Ineligible expenses, you can't use this funding to purchase land or buildings. It can't be used for debt costs or interest payments. Uh, it can't be used for property taxes, any expenditures for your six to 12 year old age groups, and it can not be used for school-based childcare spaces. In licensed home childcare, the funding can only be used for play-based materials, equipment, or furnishings. Ineligible expenses, expenses for licensed home child care, my apologies, include a purchase of land or buildings, debt costs, property taxes, expenditure for six to 12 year olds, and indoor and outdoor renovations, additions, or repairs. Startup grants will be evaluated um, based on a number of criteria. So your cost effectiveness, the availability of operating funding, capacity of your program to access funds through another program or grant or means, your budget and financial history, your licensing history, your uh, licensing operational cap operating capacity, which age groups you're serving, long-term viability and investment in quality programming. Startup grants are going to be evaluated using the same uh, application package as the expansion application. So you'll be applying for both through that same process. There's not an additional package required for your startup grants. Now, before we start wrapping up, I wanted to mention that as part of our commitment to support low income families, we're, we've made some changes to requirements for fee subsidy. So any new operator coming into SeaWelk or any spaces um, at, that expand or are added as part of the expansion program are going to be required to support our fee subsidy program. Any operator that's already enrolled in SeaWealth but might not already be a part of the C uh, the fee subsidy program is now eligible for that fee subsidy contract with the region. So we're very pleased to be opening up and supporting more families uh, who are low income. If you are interested in signing on with fee subsidy, please get in touch with Jackie Galloway at NiagaraRegion.ca. 
Now, as Satinder mentioned, this is a lot of information, so we're happy to be offering uh, three two-hour question and answer sessions. So somebody from the region will be available to answer questions. You can just drop in at any time in that time slot um, every Tuesday for the next three uh, weeks to answer any questions about expansion or startup funding. So now we'll open up the floor again to any more questions you might have about our SeaWalk expansion application process. Thanks, Kayla. And before we go there, I just want to um, make two more comments. One is we are looking to see if we can have all of this information available on our website. So we are looking to uh, have the application, the slide deck, all of this stuff. Uh, available on our website as a landing page. So uh, it will require us a little bit of time to get that up and running. But in the meantime, we will be emailing uh, these slides out as well as the application process and uh, a recording of this video out to the sector um, for, as additional information. Um, and then I know there are a number of providers that have uh, submitted their forms for 2023 where um, uh, we have selected the option that the service system manager is not in a position to make a decision uh, at this time, and you have proceeded forward with your license. Um, you are encouraged at this time to uh, submit to your CWOLC application, uh, as you had indicated in your form that you were interested, but we were not in a position uh, to approve those spaces. So I know so many of those spaces do align up with our priority neighborhoods, and you're already um, the work is already underway. So we do encourage you to start working on that application and get that into us. I'm gonna pause there to see, uh, maybe I'll do the chat questions first and then we have a hand up and I'll go there. Are you able to share the slides? Yes, the slides will be shared uh, along with that, um, the application process and uh, recording of this video. The other thing we'll share or get it on our website is we will have rolling Q and A's. So if those questions that are asked during drop-in sessions, we will be looking to turn them around and provide uh, responses in writing. Drop-ins as in, uh, when you mean drop-in as in that via virtual Q&As, yes. So they will be uh, similar to a Teams meeting like this, where like it will be an open meeting for our sector to come in and ask a question uh, and our staff will be available. Uh, another question, how long after the application deadline will licenses find out whether they'll be approved or not approved for an expansion? So we realize that we're in, we're going to be in July very soon. Uh, so we are hoping to turn it around fairly quickly. Um, I'm not going to commit to a timeline, but our hope is that we are able to um, turn it around fairly quickly. Can you show Appendix B map? Yeah, we can do that. I am going to go to someone that has raised their hand. Um, Michelle, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, so yeah, it's Michelle with Conseil Scalam Bonamnia, and I have a question based on some of the, the, based on really Kim's question at the beginning saying that there would be some flexibility between like community based spaces and school based spaces if the school board has space available in their school that's not being used. But then I noticed that the startup grant does not apply to school based spaces. So am I to understand that if the school board has existing spaces that doesn't need any renovations, there would be that flexibility because there wouldn't be any. Like I'm trying to understand if the startup grant could help to retrofit, let's say, a kindergarten classroom that's sitting empty but needs more toilets to be a room for like preschoolers. Good question. So I I, I want to go back to sort of the baseline is that if it is space available and is it is considered non-instructional and there is no classroom operating or childcare operating, those spaces can be counted towards community-based spaces. So even though they are located in a school, they were those spaces are not part of the school-based capital program. So Michelle, you'll remember that I have to sign up on those forms saying, yeah, we're submitting this application into the ministry. As long as those spaces are not part of that application process, those spaces could be deemed as non-instructional and available as community space. So to answer your question, yes, those startup grants will be available if that is the case. Awesome. Ashley Boyle. Hi there. I just wanted to seek some clarity just with respects to startup grant and licensed home child care. So um, should licensed home child care agencies want to apply, they would complete that application for those startup grants. So my question is, if the agency hasn't um, reached its license capacity, 
do they wait until they apply for that extension or expansion to apply for the startup grant is my first question. Yeah, I'll answer that one maybe Ashley for you first. Uh, no, uh, any homes that are expanded after March 31st, 2022 within your existing capacity are considered part of expansion. So licensed home is treated a little bit differently than centers. Um, because you have a licensed capacity, you are able to expand up to that licensed capacity and any additional homes that you expand as of March 31st are part of our expansion. So those homes would be eligible for a startup grant. Excellent, thank you. And then my just my second question. So for the play materials, equipment and furnishing, so that funding would go directly to the licensee. And then operationally, would we get to determine how much of that funding we would give to the provider to purchase play materials, equipment and furnishings? Or is it for the licensee to purchase and lend out that sort of equipment? Uh, so it would be for the provider to purchase on their own. We will have to see, follow the process that Kayla had on the, on the uh, earlier slide on what receipts would have to be submitted. So it would be, um, you know, based on a service agreement being signed, 20% would flow and then the rest of the funding would flow based on uh, confirmation of those expenses. Thanks, Attender. Thank you. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Mackenzie at Hickory Creek. What if you found a space in a neighboring community, West Lincoln, but the actual town was not on the list? So we are encouraging you that if you have found space and it is in a neighboring um, neighborhood to the priority communities to still submit your application. So, um, you know, can we justify where the demand is? So West Lincoln is a good example. There is a huge demand for child care there. Um, so if you're able to find space that is near that area, um, still submit your application and will be considered. Our evaluation criteria will prioritize priority neighborhoods, but that's not to say that your application will not be considered. Right. We have 590 spaces. We have had already some expansion in homes. We've had some expansion with centers that have already proceeded forward with their license and um, were interested in rolling in Seawall if we were not able to confirm. But we still do have spaces available and we will continue uh, to update on our website once we get it up and running on how many spaces are still remaining. And if we do exceed our 2023 target, that is OK as well. Uh, we we can um, ask the ministry if we could borrow some of our spaces from 2024. So there is some flexibility. Any other questions, folks? Okay. Oh, we got one more. Go ahead, David. Uh, I had a question about, I guess, uh, renting spaces. Is there an expectation that we could go and apply for um, spaces that are basically off being offered at like commercial lease rates, like whatever, whether it is $20, $25 an hour or, or per uh, per square foot, sorry, uh, or would we be expected to try to find sort of more like nonprofit oriented spaces? Um, that would be your own business decision. So I would encourage you to sort of think about what the funding uh, formula from the ministry looks like in terms of providing funding. So right now, um, the only pieces that were required to fund you from the ministry, and again, um, these are sort of the ministry guidance on how we are funded as a service system manager, and then we have to flow those funding out. So we are to fund your revenue replacement uh, and your workforce compensation and your cost escalation. So those are the three elements of CWOLC related funding that we are allowed to fund. We do provide you a CWOLC operating grant, but that comes out of the savings that we're able to realize by forecasting our budget to see how much support we can provide to our sector. So to answer your question, your business model should really look at what can you support if you are only receiving cost escalation, um, revenue replacement, and workforce compensation uh, is how I would encourage you to sort of think about that process on where you look for space. Uh, and also keep in mind that the 2024 funding formula, there was a paper that was put out that sort of outlined what the framework the ministry is thinking about in terms of um, funding C wealth moving forward. So they are looking at setting some benchmarks around uh, for Niagara region on what would be considered eligible uh, sorry, appropriate operating costs. So that is where the ministry is moving forward and how they fund 
fun to see moving forward. So I, I don't have a direct answer for you, David, but I hope that helps in terms of providing some guidance on uh, how to look for a space. Great, thanks. When will these applications come out? The applications, Akhil, I believe we're planning on releasing them today or tomorrow. Today or tomorrow. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in, but if you do, please think of something. Feel free to shoot kill on an email, and I encourage you to come into our drop-in sessions, um, and as well as let us know if there's any additional support the team can provide. Um, we are very excited about expansion, as I mentioned at the start of this meeting. Um, we desperately need spaces, and we're looking to partner with you um, to make uh, those spaces happen and realize our growth targets. Um, as you saw in our sort of our evaluation criteria, we have prioritized existing operators um, to uh, lead our expansion. Uh, we have been experiencing a number of new operators coming and looking for a license in Niagara region until this date. We haven't uh, approved any of those, but they are eligible to apply for expansion as well. But uh, our evaluation of those applications, they will have to undertake the same process, will prioritize existing providers. So we are um, looking forward to working with our existing providers to grow the system uh, in communities and neighborhoods where they need them the most. I'll just make one last comment around the staffing piece uh, because that is a challenge. Um, I think that's that's been articulated quite well in the past few years. Uh, I just want to offer a glimmer of hope that the Ministry of Education has um, uh, teased us in the media, or the minister has teased us in the media that there is a workforce strategy coming that will be looking at compensation. So there are some, um, um, there are plans in place at the provincial level. I don't have any other information at this point that the ministry is looking at this issue quite seriously, and we all anxiously are waiting for further information. So perhaps as you're thinking about uh, expansion, you might want to put that positive hat on to say, you know, in a world where I would be able to have staffing, how do I want to grow the uh, grow childcare in Niagara region? Kim, I think I've sparked one more question from you. Go ahead. Sorry, you kind of okay. answered it when, when, but I kept my hand up anyway. Um, you said that you don't have any more information in regards to the workforce compensation. I, just wondering if you know anything about if it's going to include the non RECEs, the cooks, everyone else that is so important to our organization. We wouldn't be able to, you know, uh, operate without them, mm -hmm. especially right now. And just wondering if you had any information around that. Uh, good question, Kim. Um, I was at a meeting with the ministry about two weeks ago, and I raised this very issue, asking that additional support be provided to non-RECE staff that work in our centers, given the valuable services and the support they provide in actually operating the center. Um, the ministry's response at that time was, we will take it under consideration. So I don't have an answer for you, but I have raised the issue. Great. Thank you. That's all we can ask for. Thank you, Kim. Okay, folks, I think that is it for this morning. But again, I, I, I would like to again emphasize that if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. If there's anything the team and I can do to support you through this, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are um, in this together and we're looking forward to this expansion journey and very excited. Um, so we look forward to reviewing your applications and getting more spaces built in Niagara. Thank you, everyone.